One of the hardest things about being a composer is trying to figure out how to write well for all the different kinds of instruments. There's about, what, 20 instruments that are played in most orchestras or studied in most music schools. And each one has its own range of sounds, its own particular techniques, things that work really well on it and things that are better avoided. And us composers have to do our best to try and figure it all out and learn how all these different instruments work. Each instrument is like a character, a person with their own complex backstory and individual traits that you just have to get to know. So the clarinet, for example, in its higher register is the life and soul of the party. It can be a lot of fun up there, but it can get a little bit rowdy and obnoxious if you let it. Whereas deep down in its lower register known as the Shalomo, it's like a different person. It's warm, tender and soulful. So these are the kinds of personality traits you need to get to know. And a well-written instrumental part will always follow what I call the rule of pi. So you've got P is playable. I is idiomatic, E is effective, so playable, it needs to be physically possible to play it. Idiomatic, it needs to sound like it was written with the instrument in mind, and effective, it needs to do a great job of conveying the musical idea on that instrument. So the big question is, how do composers figure all this stuff out? Well, unfortunately, two of the most common ways people try to learn some of this stuff have quite fundamental flaws. So I want to show you both the problems and some ways I found to overcome them. You can find a lot of information on how to write for instruments in books. And here's one that I have used quite a lot by Alfred Blatter. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of great information in here. You can see it has all the ranges of instruments, so you can quickly see the top and bottom notes it can play. So at the very least, this should help banish those rookie errors like writing a note that's physically impossible for the player. Because yeah, I've done that and it's quite embarrassing. But it also takes things a stage further. Let's say I've written an arpeggio passage for violin like this. How can I work out if it's going to be possible to hold my left hand in the right shape to play these notes? Well, Blatter has a page showing the fingerboard of each stringed instrument. So imagine this is the violin fingerboard, and these lines here show how far the hand can typically stretch on any one string. So on the violin at the bottom of the instrument, it's about a perfect fourth, although it can stretch a bit more when it's higher up. So that's quite useful to know, and it tells us that our arpeggio is absolutely fine because it fits within the span of a hand quite comfortably. The only problem is that's just not true in this case. So I can play the first three notes fine, but then to get that top C, I have to move these fingers here, and oof, that's just a horrible stretch which I think most violinists would refuse to play. Books, by their very nature, can't get near the sound of an instrument, but they also can't capture the full physicality of the instrument, reducing its complex nature to a series of incomplete snapshots. So learning how to write from instruments from books uh, can only take you so far. So let's try method two, which doesn't seem like a learning method at all, but it's the way that many people do try to figure out writing for instruments these days. And that's by writing your music in a notation program like Sibelius and pressing play. Like Blatter, it has plenty of useful educational aspects. So for example, if we add a note that's out of range for the instrument, like say a low E on the violin, Sibelius will kindly tell us by turning the note a nice bright red colour. Again, that's pretty useful. It's very tempting for inexperienced composers to import their notes into Sibelius or whatever app they're using, make sure it doesn't have any of those warning red notes, listen back to it, and if it sounds good, assume all must be well. The problem, of course, is that the computer playback, however good and amazing it is, has various aspects which just don't correspond to the real world. Let's take a simple pattern like this. It sounds great in Sibelius, and you wouldn't expect that a simple two-note pattern like this would cause any problems with a live performer. The two notes are played on two different strings, the E on the D string and the C on the A string, but there's no mention here of the bowing. And the way you bow something like this will completely change the way it comes across. So here are two different ways to bow it. Firstly, changing the direction of the bow every note. Now that's fine, and that might be exactly what you're after. The alternative is to play in groups of two. 
In this case, the bow glides back and forth and there's a smoothness to the sound. It sounds like it was written by someone who really knows the violin. Now, either of these might be the best approach depending on the context, but if you're relying on Sibelius to help you figure out which approach you want, and you're listening to the computer playback to help you decide, well, you're not going to get very far. The danger with Sibelius and other apps that let you play back your music is that they lull you into thinking that if it sounds good on the computer, it will work in real life too. And the feedback it does give you gives you the sense that, well, there were no warnings, so it must be okay. Now, if this all sounds like a grumpy old telling young folk today to get off technology and experience the real world because you don't know you're born, well, well, I am a grumpy old I suppose. But no, I do use Sibelius, and for the purposes we're talking about, to allow me to listen back to what I've written. It's genuinely still amazing for me to be able to type my music into Sibelius and play it back. It used to be something that composers felt a bit shy about admitting. Like if anyone caught them using Sibelius it would make headline news in the composing world. Proper composers don't need a computer, they keep everything in their head just like Beethoven. But it's such a useful tool that it'd be a bit foolish to overlook it. And I particularly like the way it turns composing into more of a sort of hands-on kind of activity. You can get a sense of things moving in real time. But I do come up against these kind of issues every day when I use Sibelius. I just have the advantage of having experience what happens when it goes wrong. When you assume that the sound you hear from Sibelius is the same as the live performance. In fact, let me give you a current problem that I'm facing, and actually the reason I felt this video was worth making. So I'm currently hard at work on a big new piece of violin concerto for violin and string orchestra. It was commissioned by the Zurich Chamber Orchestra for their music director, the wonderful violinist Daniel Hope, and it'll be premiered later on next year at the Tonhalle in Zurich, so it's a very exciting project for me. So violin and strings, lots and lots of string writing. And although I feel fairly confident about most instruments, I still find a few challenges with the double bass. For the start of the new piece, I've been toying with this harmonic texture. For those of you that don't know, a harmonic is a special kind of tone you can produce on stringed instruments by lightly touching the string at various spots, producing a higher pitched sort of whistly kind of sound. Now Sibelius does in fact attempt to play back harmonics and here's how it sounds. But the more I was getting into the piece, the more uncertain I was feeling about these particular harmonics. What I wasn't confident about was whether they would sound strongly and clearly enough for the textures I had in mind. My suspicion was that those sounds I was hearing out of Sibelius weren't true to life. So this is where I am at the moment. I'm sure if you've done any composing or arranging, you've had your moments where you're just not sure whether something's going to work or not. So let's use this as our example and I'll talk you through the different ways we can try and figure it out, whether it's going to work or not. I've got three different options for you, each of which requires a slightly higher level of commitment. Firstly, you need to hear examples of the sounds you're after and see how they're written down. Traditionally, this would mean getting recordings and following along with the score, and of course that still works. But you might see my library here and think, wow, to be a real composer, I need a collection like that. But the sad fact is, I rarely look at those these days because there are only a handful that aren't available here on YouTube, and usually in a more convenient form known as the follow along, where the pages of the score turn in time with the music. In fact, I've just in fact, I've just launched my own follow along channel of my own scores. It's called David Bruce Scores. So do subscribe to that if you want to see how some of my music works. The link's in the description. YouTube also has a wealth of instructional videos, performers showing you how to play different techniques. And most notes played in most ways on most instruments will be there somewhere. I found this score follow along by my friend Chris Cerrone. It's a piece called High Windows for String Ensemble, which uses a lot of harmonics. It doesn't have the exact bass harmonics I was after, but it was good to get a few of the sounds in my ear. Here's one of a bass player showing off some harmonics. This one's more aimed at performers, but it still has some useful stuff.
And this YouTube short has some artificial harmonics. This actually was probably one of the most useful ones. It includes a high F sharp, which was one of the notes I was looking for. Now, despite the convenience of all this, it's still quite a challenge to find the right piece or the right video if you're looking for something very specific like my bass harmonics. Okay, if you can't find what you need in videos, scores or recordings, the next level is to get your hands on a real professional player who can literally play back exactly what you're asking. Of course, this won't be an option for everyone, but do bear in mind online services like Fiverr, where you can probably get your hands on a good player to try stuff out for relatively little. For those of you more involved in the music world, say at college or university, there'll be more options and it's important to grab onto them when you can. Now, a few years ago, we recorded the first of my five composer series with players from the group Chroma. And I'd forgotten that while I had them in the room, I did grab an extra 10 minutes with the string players at the end of the session to try out some harmonics. And just to give you a sense of how useful this can be, here are 10 quick harmonic related tricks that they showed me. We started off with a little melody on natural harmonics. I got them to try crescendoing harmonics, rather like the ones I'm using in this current piece. And also to try playing them sol pont, or on the bridge, which produces this quite cool electrical kind of sound. We tried a few harmonic arpeggios, where you pick the same natural harmonic on each string. Or two different harmonics like this one. There were even a few pizzicato harmonics which are particularly cool on cello and bass. And finally this trick which I picked up from Osvaldo Goliov of a kind of shimmering harmonic alternating between the open string and the harmonic. Again you can do this on two strings at once which can be quite cool. But one lesson I'd actually forgotten I'd learnt was that these don't really work on the double bass or the cello because the strings just get stuck on the harmonic sound. Our bassist now suggested playing the stopped note on another string instead. So lots of useful stuff just from 10 minutes grabbed at the end of a session. But let's imagine that you've used up whatever connections with musicians you have. You've scoured the scores, recordings and YouTube videos and you still haven't found the sound you want. Well that's roughly where I found myself at the start of my 30s. I was no longer studying and despite all my scores, I just wasn't satisfied with the level of my writing for strings. When I did finally find the solution that cracked it for me, I was kind of annoyed at myself how obvious it was, but also relieved that I'd kept my mind open enough to embrace the new idea. And that idea was what's become one of my life mottos. If you can't get anyone else to do it, do it yourself. If I can't find anyone to test out my ways of writing for an instrument, then to hell with it, I'm gonna get an instrument and try it myself. Now, as many of you will know, I have a tendency to collect instruments. I scrounge them off friends who no longer use them, sometimes off eBay or even buy them from music shops. The first instrument I actually got my hands on was this, my granny's violin, which has definitely seen better days. The bridge has collapsed. It even has in the case an old program note from 1957. Look, there's my granny, Kate Bruce, in the second violins. And in fact, I can trace my first career successes to the pieces I wrote not long after getting my hands on this. I've since upgraded to a slightly better model and now whenever I have a violin line I'm not sure about I can grab it and test it out. Now I'm not saying I make noises that anyone wants to hear but I can check the fingering, experiment with the best bowing, check any harmonics and so on until I have a violin line that I can feel confident is playable, idiomatic and effective. 
Now, I've been lucky enough to have a cello in the house because my wife used to play, but the bass is something I've never managed to get my hands on. Until now. At last, it's mine. Now, this string piece I'm writing is a big deal for me. It's a big commission and it will get played a lot in its first season. So I really want to do a good job. And having written some of those bass harmonics and other things, I figured maybe now is the time not to buy one, but to hire a bass for a couple of months so I can test everything out and try to nail some of those bass details. And although I'm not a bass player, it's surprising how much you can learn and how much fun you can have when you've got one in your hands. So, as you can see, I've not been working hard on the violin concerto. Well, actually I have. I've done a lot on it and I needed a break, so I was willingly sidetracked into making the video. But that does mean I can't show you the final decision I made about the bass harmonics because I haven't made it yet. If you'd like to hear about the performances of the piece when they happen, do follow me on Twitter or Instagram where I'll update you about what's going on. And I'll leave you with proof that, although I find my instrument collection really useful for my composing, it really is true that I can't really play most of them. I've called this the Ode to Joining My Patreon. You don't come to hear me playing. You don't come to hear me sing. Hopefully you come to hear me talk about composing. Oh, 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 oh,